We want to welcome you to the 1130 Wednesday Luncheon Bible Study from Doctrine Studies Bible Church in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. We are in a series entitled The Foundation Doctrines of the Holy Spirit taught by Jesus at the Last Supper to his disciples recorded in John 14, 15, and 16. Uh, what we discovered or what we will learn from that series of studies, we will learn that there are, that he, that he taught seven foundational doctrines of the importance of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the church age, which would begin at Pentecost. This would be the advent or the coming of the Holy Spirit issuing in the new covenant uh, that will take us all the way to the second coming of Christ. And so we're going to talk about uh, the we have already discussed, this is our fourth lesson. We did two introductions to the greater subject of, that Jesus discussed at the Last Supper. I mean, it, this wasn't the only thing he taught on. Uh, it was a part of a, a large series of different doctrines that were going to be foundational and necessary for the disciples to learn uh, for Pentecost to begin the church age and the founding of the church. Uh, in the world so but we're we're looking at only the doctrine the seven doctrines of the foundational teaching of Jesus about the coming of the Holy Spirit and what an impact it would have on believers and and how it would affect the dispensation or the ages to come under the coming of Christ so uh, the last time we met, we talked about the first foundational doctrine, which was the indwelling, that the Holy Spirit uh, would come once Jesus was seated at the right hand of God the Father. The Holy Spirit would be sent in the name of Jesus by the Father uh, to a Pentecost to the followers, and he would begin from that point on to indwell believers. At that point, he would indwell believers throughout the entire church age. Uh, the rest of us, not the other than the 120 who were followers of Christ who were indwelt at Pentecost, one of eight works of the Holy Spirit in his advental coming. Uh, for the rest of us, we receive the indwelling at the point of salvation when we believe the gospel of Jesus Christ carried by these 120 disciples throughout the world. Uh, when we receive that, uh, when we believe the gospel, then we receive the indwelling Holy Spirit, one of eight works of the Holy Spirit, which we have already taught you in the previous lessons. This is my fourth lesson uh, on the subject uh, based on, okay, now I have the indwelling. Now what? What will the Holy Spirit do once he's in my life? So today we deal with the second foundational doctrine of the Holy Spirit that's recorded in John 14. Last, The first the first foundational doctrine is 14, 16 through 18. This one comes from 25 and 26, John 14. So today we're going to take a look at the second foundational doctrine of the uh, Holy Spirit's Advent ministry in the life of a believer, church-age believer. Now what's important for you to get before I have a word of prayer with you and we begin our study is we have already, I've already taught you that Text is always connected to context. Text and context. Now, what I'm going to teach from today is John 14, 25, 26. But the context is very, very important, which is John 14, 22 through 31. John 14, 22 through 31. So it's important that you put that down you know, look, John Dyer, he does a wonderful job with us here at Doctrinal Studies. He, he puts, you can draw down uh, the notes that I'm going to teach from today. You can come prepared to study with me off a, off a prepared notes. But if you didn't pull that down off from our website, doctrinalstudies.com, then you need to get a pencil and a paper and a Bible. You need to take notes until you can pull it down. You need to take notes. This is class. 
we're going to study the Bible. We're not, I'm not going to bring you a sermon. I'm going to bring you a Bible lesson on a, a doctrinal lesson that's going to be important for you to understand. If you're a believer, you have this ministry available to you. Okay. So the context, now the text is John 14, 25, 26. But the context is John 14, 22 to 31. All right? And it, you remember the last time we talked about three disciples of Jesus Christ at the Last Supper asked him questions, and he gave a large, a large discussion on it. I listed 14 categorical doctrines he taught. Amongst the three questions led to the question and the answer that Christ gave about the, the coming of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Now, we have a fourth disciple ask a question that our lesson comes from today. That fourth disciple's question, the fourth question, the fourth disciple and his questions, that Jesus answered his question and Jesus' answer, Jesus' answer to Judas, not Iscariot, to his question led to a second foundational doctrine, the teaching and recall indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit to the believer regarding the Word of God. Teach him recall. Teach him recall the Word of God. Now, before we have a word of prayer, I want to read to you uh, Judas, not Iscariot. He, he was another disciple of Jesus Christ. We had two Judases but not to Judas Iscariot's. And, and this Judas was not a betrayer like Judas Iscariot. And so here's what John 14, 22 says. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Question. Jesus' answer is a long Bible study. It is now going to go all the way to verse 31. In that long discussion, he's going to give several categorical doctrines. He's going to teach several doctrines that is going to be important to the church age. Because he's going to die. He's going to be buried. He's going to appear and teach these again for 40 days until he sends back to the Father. Ten days later is Pentecost and the church begins. The new covenant is in full swing. The church age of the new covenant is in full swing. Well, so Judas asks a question. Now we're in the Judas section. And in that section, he gives a second doctrine on the ministry of the Holy Spirit when he comes. He won't come until I leave, and then he comes. The Father will send him in my name, and he will come. And it's about the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach and recall the truth from the Word of God to your life. And we're going we're to discuss that today in a greater passage. Actually, Jesus has given the answer to this question earlier in John 14, 15 through 18. He also gave that answer in the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter, 21 through 23. I've got to go to Jerusalem. After Gethsemane, he's going to be arrested. And he tells him that. I'm going to, be, I'm going to go through mock trials. I'm going to be convicted. I'm going to be crucified. And on the third day of my burial, I'm going to be raised from the dead. You, you should read that. He gave that very clear understanding. Now what he's talking about to his disciples, what, what's going to happen when I leave? Are you going to be orphans? No. No, he dealt with that. We dealt with that last, last time we met. No, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the other comforter, the other helper, the word other is alas in the Greek language. It means one of the same kind. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit would come. God the Holy Spirit would come and dwell the, in the life of the believer, John 14, 16, forever. Once he takes up residence, it's forever. 
You must understand these doctrines and the truth from them. They're the foundation doctrines of the church. So let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to come and look at three of four points. The fourth point is going to be a home study I'm going to give you. We're going to look at three points that are really important to the ministry of the Holy Spirit called teach and recall the truth of the Word of God from our souls. The Holy Spirit will teach and recall the Word of God from our souls to our life experiences. Now remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. There is no book like this. There is no book ever in a library like this. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Carnality is a, a new covenant word. It's a, a church age word. It means living in the flesh and not in the power of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, 16 and 17. How do I get out of carnality living in the flesh for the world view of life as opposed to living in the Holy Spirit and the divine viewpoint of life? We live in a unique a period of human history, biblical history, the church age. So how do I get out of carnality in back into the indwelling, which is the permanent? He cannot leave me forever. I leave him. He does not, he's never leaves me. How is it that I, that, that process happens? How do I get in carnality and back to spirituality? I confess my sin. First John 1, 9, written to believers. If we confess our sin, it could be mental attitude, it could be sins of the tongue, it could be overt sins. Just to give you an idea. If we confess that he is faithful and just, now watch this. He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That takes us back to the cross in 1 John 1, 7. Cleansing. The, the blood of Christ works differently for believers than unbelievers. For unbelievers, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, a damning sin that has put 13 judicial charges on you that only the blood of Christ can remove, you need to study that. You can find it in our categories of doctrine. You need to understand that. Adam's sin. When you believe that Jesus died to remove that sin barrier, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, you get saved. When you believe it, you get saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Romans 1, 16, the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, death, burial, and resurrection. The gospel is the power of God to save those who believe. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, therefore, because you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourself, it's the gift of God. Now, that's how you get saved. But the cross also works for the Christian. When I commit sin, carnality, I'm not lost because I commit sin. I've, I've gone back to the bondage of the flesh, of the sin nature. When I confess that, I get removed from that position back to the position of the indwelling Holy Spirit called spirituality in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. You need to read this stuff. I mean, I tell it to you every week that you visit with me. But so when I confess my sins, the blood of Christ works to restore me to spirituality, to the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, which is vital. So I'm going to give you a moment to do that. Would you please do that? It is for your benefit, not mine. I've already done it for my life. You need to do it for yours. You need to do it for yours so that the Holy Spirit can teach and recall. You can actually experience the doctrine I'm going to teach you today, you can actually experience it. Let's pray. So our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. We thank you, Father, those who have visited with us by the Internet that are faithful, Father, to study our Wednesday study. And at lunchtime, I come to their home because they can't come to mine because of the restrictions uh, still by our city of Birmingham on the COVID. So we come to you, Father, by the Internet to teach the people who are hungry for the Word of God, who want to understand the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in their life because they live in the dispensation called the church age. And they're under a new covenant, not an old covenant for life. Our life is lived under new rules and regulations called the new covenant. Teaches and a great portion of that 
is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So today, Father, teach us this so that we can recall it to our life in Jesus' name and share it with others. Amen. Well, here we go. Today, we look at the second foundation doctrine of the Holy Spirit called teach and recall of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit. It came from Judas, not Iscariot, question in John 14 and goes, uh, the answer Christ gave begins in verse 23 and goes all the way to 31. So I have to call that to your attention under point one. We read Judas's question in 1423. I want to read 23 through 31 and show you five doctrines that I would list, that I would teach my people and have and will again. Other doctrines that Jesus taught that day. So let's take a look at 23, 24 would be one. John 14, 23, 24. Remember 22 is Judas, not his cares question. Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. Did you get the conditions? You want the father to love you? Of course you do. Listen, he loves the world. He gave, he gave his son. If you want to know the love of God, if you're an unbeliever and want to know the love of God, you go to the cross. But if you're a believer, that's not an issue anymore. You know God loves you. That's not what he said. Listen to me now. Jesus answered and said, anyone who loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. Do you understand the conditions for a believer? If you love Christ, watch this now, and his teachings, this would be one of them. My father will love you. Think about that. Now, he already loves me because I believed that he sent his son to die on the cross. I, I believe John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about removing the 13 judicial charges of, of which one of the 13 is perishing. Yes, you can see how much the father loved you to die, to, to send his son to die for, for your worst state of condition, which is not how you live, it's because you're an Adam. You need to read the, the Romans, the fifth chapter 12 to the end, if you want to know that. This is not what this is about. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. See, it's not a love said, well, I love Jesus. No, I'll tell you, Jesus says, if you love me, you love my word. If you love me, you love my teaching. And if you love me to love my teachings, the Father will love you. Come on, church. Come on. I don't know where you get all this foolishness in your heart. But here's the clear teaching. Jesus will teach and recall. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. The father will say, I love you in a special way. You know, I love you, you child of God. I love you in a special way because you, because you have chosen to love Jesus above all other things in this life. You've chose to love Jesus and you've chose to follow his teachings. And for that, I love you. I love you in a special way. <laughs> Are you getting that? Let the spirit teach you today. Listen to verse 24. He who does not love me does not love, does not keep my words. And the word which you have is not mine, but the Father who sent me. And so I, I wrote down one of the doctrines I would teach my people is the love of the Father for the world. For the world, the love of Christ is greater. 
the lover, whatever, whatever love the Father has for the world, his love for the believer is greater. Because you love the Son, and you love the teachings of the Son, and the Father loves you special. You should, you should probably write that on your paper as I just did, because I forgot the second wing to that. John, now, a second doctrine I found in verses 25 through uh, 27, uh, part of the teach and recall, my passage. These things I have given to you while abiding with you. That means before Jesus ascends back to heaven to be seated on the throne. But in contrast to my abiding with you, temporarily, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things I said to you. Listen, here, here is something he teaches now. Peace I leave with, here's another thing. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives peace do I give to you, let not your hearts be troubled, nor let it be afraid. And so there is a, a whole other doctrine. In verse 27, I would teach the peace of Christ. Now watch this. The peace of Christ is greater than the peace of the world. Verse 28 and 29. You heard that I said to you, I go away and I will come to you. He's been teaching that really heavy at the Last Supper. That when it comes, no, let's see, I dropped down, I dropped too far. I have said to you, I go away and I will come to you. If you love me, see, he's back to that subject, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father, for the Father is, watch this now, is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it comes to pass, you might believe. Look, you know what he's saying? He said, if, if you will embrace the, the word that Jesus is teaching now and let it work in your life, when the experience you're going through in your life is completed, you will have found how faith works. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And it's there in your belief system for application. It's the faith cycle. This is what he's teaching. It's exactly what he's teaching you. Are you getting it? And now I have told you before it comes to pass that when it comes to pass, you may believe. That's the power of the faith cycle. See, faith comes by hearing. Hearing has to be brought to a faith system where I believe it. Now it's become my part of my faith ideas. That brings me to applying walk in the walk by means of the word and not by sight. And that brings me to it has come to pass. In other words, the completion of the word of God in my life is when the word of God has exercise, been exercised in my real life experiences. And now my faith has been bolstered, has been improved, has, has grown, and I'm ready to cycle more doctrine. I'm ready to go back to faith comes by hearing, but hearing to believing, believing to applying, applying to completing. So I, I would teach that. I, I would teach a doctrine called the plan of God is greater than even Christ. Listen to me. The plan of God trumps even Jesus Christ. The advent of Jesus Christ, the plan of God, he, listen, he said that the plan of God is greater even than Christ. Verse 30 and 31. See, I'm still contextually, I'm still in the context of where I should, where, where my lesson came from. I will not speak much more with you for the ruler of this 
uh, world is coming. That is Satan. He, he and coming. Listen, he's headed to, listen to me now. What's he mean? He's coming. I thought he was already here. Well, he is already here. What does it mean he's coming? It means he's already been sent to arrest me. He's headed to Gethsemane. He's headed to the Last Supper. Oh, my God. I will not speak much more with you, for the ruler of the world is coming for me. And he has nothing in me. You know why we know? Because before Jesus started this whole discussion on the Holy Spirit, at the Last Supper, he waited. He held this whole lesson system off until Judas Iscariot had left to go bring the enemy to arrest Jesus. Man, yeah, well, you... Just read John 14, 15, and 16. I will not speak much more with you, for the rule of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. You know what that is? Go to the cross, son. You've, you, I have put your humanity in hypostatic union. I've held it there. For over 30 years, I wanted to go as your body offering for the sins of the world. And I'm going to require your blood. The perfect blood of a lamb, John 1.29, for the sins of the world. Hope you see all that. And you know what he just taught you? In my opinion, Christ and the plan of God are greater than Satan. You must always remember that. Now, in the midst of this, I just listed five categorical doctrines that, and there are more. I just listed five. There's more there that you could certainly teach from the context. I've chose to teach one of those five called Teach and Recall, verse 25 and 26. Teach and Recall the Word of God by the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit, point number two. Now look, before, <laughs> look, I, I, I know. I get a lot of emails that says, oh, you go so fast. You give cover so much information. I know, look, I know. I know. My pastor, teacher, did that same to me. But God is a marvelous grace. Now, if you, if you attended my church, I would repetitively teach these things. But you're on the Internet. But you know the advantage you have to my, well, not much of an advantage, but you know you have the same privilege that my people have. You can listen to this over and over and over. I, we give you a printout, and we give you a tape, and you can listen to this over and over and over. Listen, I have a guy in the church that reminds me all the time that he has to listen to most of my doctrines 10 times to get it. I do understand that because I said to a pastor that did the same thing, and I had to do it. I listened to these doctrines over and over and over because he, he gave so much information. Listen, I know we overfeed. We give doggy bags. I know that. We overfeed. I know that. So what do you do with doggy bags? If it's good food, you keep eating until it's gone. And that by the time it's gone, it's, being, it's now being used by the energy of your life. Yeah, I know that. If you study here, you've got to know that. And you've got to study this stuff. You, it's not a one hearing. This is not. I mean, I know you're used to that kind of stuff just to have your ears tickled. This is about changing your heart for God. Point number two. Okay. Now I feel better. Thank you for, uh, thank you for allowing me to tell you that because I have a lot of requests that come to me and they go like, well, Jesus, you give me so much. Yeah, but listen, John Dyer logs his personal time into making it convenient for you to listen and listen and listen and listen and listen until you get it. You're like the disciples of Christ. 
It's okay. They had to hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it, and hear it to get it. It's okay. It's okay. Jesus overfed, I overfeed. Most good pastors do. I don't know. What can I tell you? Point number two. Like the other disciples of Jesus, Judas, the son of James, is struggling with cycling certain categorical doctrines from his mind to his heart. Just like, a, listen, these are hand-picked disciples of Jesus who are going to be the foundational structure of the church in the world. I mean, these guys are in stained glass windows in most churches. They, they wrote books in the New Testament under the New Covenant. And right now, at the peak of Jesus dying on the cross, they are struggling with certain categorical Bible doctrines of cycling them from their mind, a lobe of perception, uh, uh, the mind of perception, to the heart of comprehension, of getting it. They're hearing it, but they're not getting it. Okay? That's important that you understand this. Second Thessalonians is an important doctrine at this point. As of important scripture, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is inspired by God, is God breathed, inhaled, exhaled, taking it in and putting it out. I mean, you know, God breathed, the King James Bible hit it right on the head when he called it. They, they changed to the inspiration in the other English translations, but God breathed is what it actually says in the Greek text. That vows inhale, exhale. You've got to take the word of God in and you've got to apply it to your life. And he goes on to discuss that. Very important. I know now you're ready to write it down. That's okay. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Judas, not a scared, is listed, if you're interested in knowing something about the guy, he's listed in Luke 6, 12 through 16, and Acts 1, 13, he was one of the 120. Judas, son of James, is like many of us believers. He's not well known by many, but a devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. His question shows he is still struggling with Messiahship of Jesus Christ. John 14, 22. Lord, why are you disclosing yourself to us and not to the world? I thought the Messiah had come to set up a golden ruled kingdom. Well, that's the millennium, not the church, for those of you. Point number three, just trying to get you to understand where Judas is coming from and what his struggle is. He has an enormous struggle, and he's not getting it. Judas does not have a frame of reference. Pay attention to that word. He does not have a frame of reference in his heart for this specific categorical doctrine, revelation of the indwelling ministry of the Holy Spirit in the place of Jesus Christ, even though Jesus has taught them this in John 14, verses 16 and 17. He's going to teach it again in the 16th chapter, verse 8. He has already taught it in Matthew 3, 11, and he's going to teach it again in Acts 1, 5. Now, you need to, you need to study those. You need to study him. Judas represented a breakdown in the faith cycle from the mind to the heart of the soul in the disciples of Jesus at the Last Supper. Now listen, you need to write this on a piece of paper. The faith cycle, it works clockwise. Put an H up there for hearing. Over 3 o'clock, you want to put believing down at 6 you want to put applying, and over here at 9, you want to put completing, and then draw it back up, and it runs clockwise. In hearing, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God. You got to have ears to hear. You got to be positive to inhale so that it can be positive at exhale. Positive inhale, you got to be positive at exhale. Inhale is on the side of hearing and believing. Exhale is on the side of applying and completing. 
You got to learn this. You got to walk by faith, not sight. You've got to know where faith comes for application. It comes by hearing. It comes by believing. Then comes to application. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And they're, they're having difficulty. They're having difficulty on inhale, exhale. They're having difficulty. They're struggling. The mind, the mind is over here on hearing and believing. The heart is on applying what you believe, applying what you believe to life experiences so that God can develop capacity in your life to, to, to enter a new experience uh, in the coming day of your life, in, in another experience or another life experience. He's building muscle of your life in faith. Like a distance runner, you start out a mile, then you go to three miles, five miles, 12 miles, 26 miles. Or you go to the gym and you, you build from this to this to this to this. That's the idea. So Judas represents a breakdown of the faith cycle from the mind to the heart of the soul in the disciples at the Last Supper. These disciples were struggling with previous hell beliefs of the Messiahship. We call that old man cosmos diabolicus when it becomes in conflict with new divine revelation. They were struggling with previous, previous held beliefs of Messiahship and what was being currently taught by Jesus, new man divine viewpoint thinking, new revelational teaching. You know, where are you in all this? That would be a question to ask you. To understand their spiritual struggle, I, we need to understand the spiritual makeup of the soul and how it functions in the life of a believer. It's important you get this. Because this is where you struggle and I struggle the same way they struggle with the Word of God. So let me tell you, here is a passage you need to write down and look at, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. It tells you that the, the, human, the, the, the human life is divided in three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. Now, I want to look at the soul for a minute because Jesus dies to save the soul. You all know that, all right? The soul. The soul consists of five basic parts. That is just basic. But there are five parts that you need to be aware of. Self-consciousness, conscience, self-conscious awareness of oneself in the world, and, and also from that, the, the existence of God. The existence of yourself, I'm not dreaming, I'm alive, and the existence of God. Then you've got a conscience, you know, dictates to your right and wrongs that you've learned. A conscience. You've got mentality. Mentality, I'll talk about it in a moment, has a mind and a heart. And you've got volition, free will. That's part of the, that's the key in the angelic conflict to understand that. And you have emotions. Now, we all know that. All right? So I just want to call your attention to the five basic parts of the, of the soul that's really important. Okay, that, that's, that's my first point. That, that's an A point. Now I want to talk about mentality of the soul. There is a mind part and a heart part. There's a mind part and a heart, and a heart part. The mind part is where the word of God first engages you. That's where, that's where the word of God is engaged, is in my mind. And we, we, call that, we call that perception. This is where perception of truth comes. In order for that to switch over to the heart, that's where the whole faith system works. Faith comes by hearing mind. Faith comes by hearing and for it to be transferred from the heart. See, what's in the mind gets transferred to the heart when the heart hears the word of God and believes it. It becomes faith to build on and to be applied in your life. It becomes faith. Faith comes by hearing the perception side 
See, you, you want it to come in one ear, stay and develop in your heart. You don't want it to come in one ear and go out the other. That's what the disciples were doing. It was going in. He was teaching them new divine revelation about the coming of the Holy Spirit. It was going in one ear and coming out the other. That's not how it's designed to work. It's designed to come into the ear. He who has ears, let him hear. Faith comes by hearing. It has to be believed, just like the gospel. It has to be believed. When it comes believed, it becomes your faith. Faith now has an opportunity to be exercised in your life. Walk by faith, not by sight. So the mind, the mind is where you first engage. And so Jesus is teaching them new, new divine revelation, teaching on the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I've got to leave. He's got to come. You've got to be aware of that. You've got to prepare. You've got to prepare yourself for that. So there's the mind. That's the perception side of the teachings of Jesus on revelational truth. Then the heart, heart is where comprehension is. When it gets to the heart, you see, you could hear something like 101 of anything, math, English, alphabet. It's not till it becomes resident in you. It's got to be believed on. And then the alphabet can be turned into words and communications and all kinds of things. But it has to go from hearing to believing. Once it's believed and understood, and comprehended, now you're able to take it into many phases of what it was created to do. Uh, alphabet turns into words, words turn into conversations, and, and etc. Communications. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Mentality consisting of the mind and the heart was where the disciples were struggling. They were struggling with previously held beliefs in their heart. So what they're hearing never registered. They were struggling. I believe Jesus is teaching me something I should hear, but I already know the answer. But they, but it, they were wrong. <laughs> they were wrong. They were wrong. Listen to me now. 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3. Paul says, you are letters, you are epistles, like Colossians, Ephesians, etc. You are letters written in our hearts, knowing and read, that should be with an A. <laughs> Let me correct it on my paper. I put the word red, like a color. It, knowing and read by all men, being manifest, listen, when the word of God is written in your heart, when the word of God is written in your heart, it is known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, the teachers, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, watch this now, but tablets of the human heart. And I'm going to mention five tablets of the human heart because that's the key. You've got to get the word transferred by the Holy Spirit. Teach, recall. Uh, on the ear is teaching and hearing. You've got to believe it to get it transferred over here for it to be exercised by faith through your life. Paul called them tablets of the heart. The far heart, here's my point. I'm still under point three. The heart has five tablets that I want to mention. Memory center, frame of reference, vocabulary, beliefs, and spiritual IQ. Why don't you get that? Over, tablets of the heart, memory center, once the word of God is heard and believed upon, it is filed within five areas of tablets of the heart. Memory center. You have the word of God. 
both short and long term in retention. Memory center is retention. You have short and long term retention. Under the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, under the ministry of the indwelling, he teaches and recalls. That's where is recall? In memory center, in frame of reference. You have a frame of reference in the heart, a frame of reference. That's where categorical doctrine is able to approach life experiences from your own, from your own heart. You're able to apply, you're able to understand and apply, no matter what your circumstances are, you're able to apply categorical Bible doctrine to your life experiences. You, you have a frame of reference. Listen to me now, this is important, because we saw that the disciples had no frame of reference for what Jesus was teaching them, even though he had previously taught them several times on the same subject. They have been refusing to believe it on several occasions when he taught the same thing. They were listening. They were hearing, but not believing. And why were they not believing? Because they thought they already knew the answer, and they didn't. Vocabulary. These are doctrinal words that are associated and put together for communications of categorical thinking doctrines. They become beliefs in our heart. These beliefs are divine viewpoint regarding the cosmic lies. When you have the truth of God in your soul, in your heart, and it's part of your belief system, you're able to combat all the lies of John 8, 44. The devil is a liar about the truth of the word of God. And you're, when he lies to you, you're able to bring out of your heart, you're able to bring a belief that counteracts it. That's recall. That's recall. Beliefs and divine truths. Beliefs that are viewpoints against cosmic lies and are for divine truth. Philippians 2.5. Let this heart be in you that was in Christ Jesus. How about that? And spiritual IQ, only people that can have spiritual IQ are believers in Christ. It, spiritual IQ gives the believer the ability for spiritual growth maximum to retain, to develop the capacity for application of categorical doctrine information into life experiences. John, the eighth chapter, I put an end there. I don't know why I doubled end it. John 832, you shall know the truth. The truth will set you free from what? cosmic lies we're in the eighth chapter of john down in verse 44 he's going to say from the lies of the devil also you ought to read ephesians 1 18 let me give you second corinthians 4 4 in whose case the god of this world satan has blinded the minds of those who are unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of christ who is the image of god a message to the world. He records it, he records it in the fourth chapter, four through six. And why? Because the natural man, the unbeliever, is called the natural man in 1 Corinthians 2:14. They can't understand the word of God. Why? They don't have the Holy Spirit. They're not born again and don't have the Spirit of God. Now I'm going to leave with you today a home study. As point number four. I want you to be careful to read how Jesus closed the Judas section with a threefold promise to the believer in John 14, 27 to 31. I broke it into three parts of promise, threefold promise. In verse 27, the peace of Christ is greater than the peace of the worlds. And he talks about it earlier in John 14, 1 through 4. Let not your hearts be troubled. In John 14, 28, 29, the plan of God is greater even than Christ himself. John 16, 7, John 17, uh, John 7, 37 through 39. 
Then John 4, finally, John 14, 30, 31. Perpetual satanic warfare. The ruler of this world. We're at war with him. He's at war with the plan of God uh, during the church age. And I gave you a lot of passage of scriptures you should put down. Like John 12, 31, 1430, 1611, 1 John 4, 4, 1 John 5, 19, Ephesians 6, 10 through 17. All on your paper, you should study those things. You should study them as if nobody else teaches them. And they're vitally important to victory in the angelic conflict. This lesson is about the indwelling ministry of teach and recall and how important it is to develop your soul and your heart. To develop your soul and your heart. And when you develop them, it'll be good for your body. You should read Proverbs about how good the word of God is for your body. The word of God, you take all kinds of medicines and all kinds of pills and all kinds of vitamins for your body. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm telling you not to do it and exclude the word of God. <clears throat> Read Proverbs. Let us pray. Father, we're so thankful today for your love, mercy, and grace. We thank you for these who have traveled uh, well, those who have come by internet with us across the world to study with us the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. May they understand something about teach and recall from their souls. They need to get this. This is a foundation doctrine to the church, to the believer, and his responsibility to the plan of God in this dispensation to call the church age. My, my Father, help, help us understand the truth and may the truth set us free. And may we become great disciples of the truth to other people who are living in ignorance and struggling with the truth of God because they think they already have the answers and they don't have a clue because they've not studied the word of God. They've not cycled the word of God. They've not inhaled it and exhaled it. They're like the disciples who have assumed a false position that's become a false interpretation and a false expectation and a false application, just like the disciples, because they wouldn't listen. They wouldn't transfer from hearing to the heart under the faith cycle. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.